Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to a series of unfortunate reviews, the show where I dissect the Netflix show of almost the same name with a particular emphasis on if it stayed loyal to the books it's based on by Daniel Handler. Once again, please note that this is not spoiler safe for anyone who's not read the books up to their conclusion because this show seems obsessed with bringing in later plot points as soon as possible, so I gotta talk about it. Book the Eighth, The Hostile Hospital. As usual, let's start with the elements of the episodes that are loyal to the book. We have the wee Baudelaire orphans now on the run from the authorities for crimes they did not commit, I was going to make an A-team joke here but ultimately decided I couldn't be bothered, decide it's worth the risk to go inside a general store and try to communicate with someone who might help them. They have to leave in a hurry as the store owner sees their false accusations in the newspaper and having no other choice they jump into a van full of hippies who happen to call themselves the VFD, in this case the volunteers fighting disease who mistake them for new recruits. Ah, now seems like a good time to introduce a new word I'm trying to coin, coincivenient, which means when a writer tries to pass something off as a staggering coincidence, but it's pretty obvious it's just convenient lazy writing. The coincidentally named group are a bunch of self-proclaimed super positive people who go to hospitals singing songs to patients to cheer them up. The kids end up following them to Heimlich Hospital, which for some reason was only half built, leaving one side of the building as just an empty framework. Hoping to avoid anyone who might recognize them from the paper, the kids take a job in the hospital hall of records with a man named Hal who has exceptionally poor vision. While working there, they discover, very coincidentally, that there's a fire locked in a cabinet that holds information on the fire that killed their parents and is labelled with the name Snicket. Soon after, as usual, Count Olaf shows up, but the children decide to stick around long enough to try to get their hands on that file. Despite feeling quite a bit of guilt over betraying the kindly old guy who'd been so nice to them, they steal house keys and sneak back into the Hall of Records at night. What little of the file they get a chance to examine seems to suggest there might have been a survivor of the Baudelaire fire. Unfortunately, Esme Squalor turns up at this exact moment wearing shoes made of actual stilettos, which is apparently what's currently in fashion. Klaus and Sonny escape, but Violet is captured. Later, Klaus realises that Olaf must be hiding his sister somewhere in the hospital by pretending she's a patient using a fake name. Looking over some notes left over from the destroyed Quagmire notebooks, he realises that the Count has an inescapable habit of using anagrams for people's names when trying to hide their identity. So, he and Sonny figure out where Violet is by rearranging alphabet suit letters to assist in finding her name on a list of patient rooms and then put on disguises to go and extract her. They find out that Olaf intends to kill Violet because because getting a fortune from two orphans you don't have is easier than getting it from the one that you do, uh, and intends to do it by convincing everyone that chopping her head off is a legitimate medical procedure, so he can do it in front of everyone in a surgical theatre, which especially in the book seemed a little convoluted to me, seeing as he had already killed someone by throwing them off the top of the building. Yeah, the logic in this particular part of the book got a little flimsy even by Daniel Handler's standards, which is probably why the show's loyalty to it got a little flimsy too. In trying to rescue her, Klaus and Sonny end up in a position where they are the ones who have to perform the deadly surgery. They stall long enough for the general anaesthetic to wear off Violet, but then get exposed by the baddies, seemingly dooming them all to a life in jail. But as Olaf has just set fire to the hospital records room, it spreads to the rest of the hospital and they manage to escape in the confusion. Bungie jump out of the window and make the desperate decision to hide in the back of Olaf's car to escape the area. I'll try to make the missing pieces at the end there make a bit more sense in a moment, but no promises. I'm still trying to make sense of it myself, to be honest. I kind of felt that Neil was really pushing his luck with the rhymes in the opening again. He had to pronounce actors as octors to make it fit with doctors. This book is a slight deviation from the established formula thus far because the orphans are no longer under the care of a gullible and incompetent guardian. They're forced to the hospital by circumstance because they're evading pursuit, however, they make the decision to stay there even after knowing Olaf has arrived. The book's justification for this seems a little sketchy. They seem to be under the impression that the Snicket file they just learned was in the hospital records room might might contain something that would clear their names. As they have no idea how long that file's been there, and they were only accused of these crimes a day ago, that seems highly unlikely to me, and they also appear to be forgetting that logic and evidence have done them little to no good in the past, as people always seemed more inclined to believe whatever garbage excuse that Olaf came up with instead. All in all, as at the time of his first reveal the Baudelaire's didn't know that Olaf was there for the file and not them, I would have thought immediately running away from the hospital and coming back for the information at a later date would have made much more sense. Once again, Handler seems to be undercutting his kids smart, adults dumb theme that everyone seems to like so much. The show tries to address this somewhat by Klaus making a speech about not wanting to run forever and taking their fates into their own hands, but I don't know, it still seems kind of sketchy to me. There's actually quite a few examples like this where there's a massive plot hole in the book and Netflix is making a token effort to try and correct for it. One is all the people who mentioned in the show about how the hospital had records sent to it from all over the world. In the book, the VFD singer simply mentions that the kids need to find a hall of records 
records, not specifically the one in the hospital, and it's never fully addressed why the fuck the hospital would have files sent to it about anything other than hospital business, which also raises the question as to why the kids even went inside the hospital in the first place and didn't just pull a 180 and bugger off as soon as the van arrived. It's also a bit coincidental that Olaf was at the hospital at the exact same time as them to destroy the file about the fire in the book, so the show made it so he had no idea the file even existed and was indeed tracking the orphans. I'm really not sure why the Last Chance store is wonky, I guess the unimaginative building designer from the Harry Potter movies, who annoyed me so much, has finally managed to find more work. The store owner was actually very kind to the orphans before the newspaper showed up and informed him they were killers, letting them use the telegraph machine for free and giving them some breakfast. It's part one of the themes of the book where it's extra hurtful for the kids to be turned on by someone they liked. It's worth noting that in the book, the kids were attempting to contact Mr. Poe for help via Multuary Money Management, but in the show they mentioned their real target should be his secretary Jacqueline, as they know she has something to do with whatever's going on behind the scenes, which might have made more sense, but if you'll recall, both of these characters were in the village of found devotees just a few hours ago, so them assuming either of them would be able to receive a message sent to a bank was rather stupid. See, I knew this show's obsession with including Mr. Poe in every episode was going to bite them in the ass eventually. Olaf isn't in this scene at all in the book, and they successfully send the entire message to Mr. Poe, and when he doesn't get back to them, that's the start of the other recurring theme, i.e. no news is good news is a stupid philosophy. This highlights one of the biggest issues I have of these adaptations. Another of the reasons that people seem to like these books are the little tangents that Snicket went on in between the orphan's story, in this case talking about the many reasons why someone might not respond to an attempt at communication. Snicket is in the show, and sometimes they adapt these things into a visual representation, and it's probably the least boring part of every episode, but they just don't quite seem willing to commit to it, and would rather pad the episode's runtime with shitty jokes and sequences that go absolutely nowhere. Fun fact, the Baudelaire's, and by extension the reader, don't actually see Count Olaf at all in this book. The closest they come to it is hearing him through some thick smoke hauling out from inside a car. Most of the time he's just making announcements through the hospital tannoy. But of course they were never going to do that in the show, because at this point it's basically Count Olaf and friends, and also there's some young characters in the background you're caring less and less about because of their constant inability to be funny or interesting. The Sugar Bowl once again plays a bigger part in the show than in the book, wherein it was only mentioned in Snicket's narrated confession that he was the one who stole it from Esme Squalor. It's now confirmed as being Esme's only real reason for sticking around and pursuing the Baudelaire so fanatically, as opposed to just being in love with Olaf. Coincidentally, despite using the word sugar bowl over and over again so many times it was clearly driving Olaf mad, when chasing after the Baudelaire's, Esme, for no apparent reason, instead uses every possible descriptive word in existence that could describe both a bowl and a tin of film, so there could be a plot advancing misunderstanding. The volunteers fighting diseases were fairly book accurate, and it amused me to see them try to actually make that last line of the song about a heart-shaped balloon work when it clearly had just like one too many syllables to fit. They also successfully recaptured that they were all talk and no actual help, as a positive attitude will only take you so far in medicine and shouldn't be prioritised over actual treatment. Uh, I was wondering if their ineffectiveness was a commentary on homeopathy in the book. I also like that the show successfully made their singing into something ominous at the end, though that one member who became increasingly bloodthirsty as the episode went on might have been a bit much. I mean, the volunteers only assisted Olaf's henchmen because they were trying to be helpful, they didn't actually want to see anyone die. Babs, I think, is now the second character from the book who's been spared dying off screen via being thrown from a great height by Count Olaf, adding to this character's inconsistency in regards to willingness to murder. They also, evidently, decide to keep using her throughout as a minor comic relief character. Along with Olaf, you never actually see Babs in the book. She had this philosophy that children should be seen and not heard, therefore adults should be heard and not seen, so she only ever communicates with people through the announcement system. There's even a joke where the kids go into her office and it's just another speaker on her desk. I had a random thought while I was watching this episode and looking at Sunny where I wondered just how aware is this toddler that she's in a TV show? I mean, what's it going to be like for her in 20 years looking back at all this? I mean, at the age she is now there's no guarantee she'll want to have anything to do with acting when she grows up. and. I mean, will she even like a series of unfortunate events? The show took the time to actually establish that the entire hospital was obsessed with paperwork, not just how, so it didn't come out of nowhere when Klaus suggested it as a way to stall the operation at the end. The book just kind of explained it with, well, people will get behind anything if it comes from someone who looked like a medical professional. I don't think the actor playing Hal was old enough, and they gave him regular sized glasses instead of the teeny tiny ones described in the book. Uh, you'd think with such visual descriptions to work with they could do a better job than this. Man, I swear, in the weeks building 
leading up to this, everyone seemed to be raving about this scene where Olaf was walking down the hallway smashing all the light bulbs. I mean, they were sending me gifts of it and saying, look, Olaf finally becomes intimidating in this episode. But when I finally got to it, I was like, well... That kind of came out of nowhere with absolutely no build-up, and is immediately followed by a bunch of jokes undercutting the whole mood. It was kind of just disappointing, really. It's also the start of a completely pointless sequence where they scare Babs right before kidnapping her. I mean, just kidnap her, she doesn't need to be scared for you to do that. There's quite a few Shining references in this, which confused me a bit because that's set in a hotel, not a hospital. I mean, I'm pretty sure there's going to have to be an episode about a hotel next season, I might have saved the jokes for that. The Snicket Report, originally the final overlooked remaining page of a written report that was mostly confiscated by the authorities, became a film in the show starring Jack Snicket that the kids were distracted from before they could fully view. This does serve three useful purposes. One, it makes it more interesting for the audience to watch. Two, it squeezes one last use out of the show's best actor, and three, it justifies the file having Snicket's name on it, something Handler neglected to do in the books. I consider the Snicket report, along with the Sugar Bowl, a good sign that Handler had a lot in common with J.J. Abrams when he was helping to write Lost, i.e. very good at setting up intriguing mysteries, but forgetting that you have to have some fucking payoff for it eventually. The plotline that there might have been a survivor to the Baudelaire fire is never resolved. There's some suggestion that Quigley Quagmire might have been who they were referring to, but that doesn't really fit because then the report would have had to have been called the Quagmire Fire. I'm assuming that because they made such a big deal out of this info in the show that they're actually planning to handle this mystery a little better this time around, but time will tell with that one I guess. They've already used the Baudelaire Quagmire fake out once before so hopefully it won't be that again. Okay, I'm about to briefly discuss the possibility of sexual assault being in this story, so if you'd rather not hear about that, skip forward to this time code now. Though, spoiler warning, though the discussion may get a little dark, the end result is I don't think there was any, so it might not be too bad. In the build-up to covering this episode, either several people or one person who was obsessed enough to message me from multiple places tried to warn me that Count Olaf clearly rapes Violet in this story during the time that she's held captive away from her siblings, and possibly while she's under the general anaesthetic. Upon rereading this part of the story, I don't really see much evidence to support this. Olaf might have had the inclination and the opportunity, but that's all the theory seems to be based on. As a counter-argument, I would remind everyone that Esme was with him at this point in the story, and unlikely to allow Olaf to cheat on her in this manner, that even if Violet was unconscious at the time, she would have known she'd been assaulted when she woke up for reasons I shouldn't have to spell out for you, and I just don't think Handler is that sick, even if apparently he is a bit of a creep in real life, according to reports. I think this is just some people reading too much into something because they like the idea of stuff being darker than it actually is. It's the same group of people who will swear to you that Ash Ketchum has been in a coma for ten years and that the Rugrats are all dead and or a figment of Angelica's imagination. Moving on. They included most of the story about Lemony Snicket's friend who swallowed his butterflies to protect them from jail, though I think they probably should have included the part where he burps them out again after three years because I noticed in the show there's no indication that they weren't eventually, you know, digested. There's a scene where Violet escapes with Babs and then is recaptured like three minutes later. I can't help but feel there's been a steady decrease in the skill with which they've added in the filler segments needed to stretch these books out to two episodes. By the way, saying that Oxford sounds made up is, is offensive. It's prejudiced against British people. In the books, the Baudelaire's look a little dumb for assuming that Anagram is a person called Anagram. In the show, it's the Quagmire's turn to look like nitwits, because why else would Duncan have split the word Anagram up besides insufferable idiocy? I mean, sure, coincidence, but I'm looking for in-universe reasons. I kid you not, I actually muttered, oh no, not Mr. Poe, when he showed up again in a story that he has no place in, but at least they kept his screen time to a reasonable limit this time. I must confess, I never would have predicted Mr. Poe would ever be the recipient of the Legolas effect. While I would say that this episode diverged from the books just as much as all the others, it's in a different way, because instead of going off the rails in the middle and then bringing it back towards the finish, as I mentioned before, it's the end of this story that's more of its own thing. In the show, it's pretty clear that Olaf isn't fooled for a second by Klaus and Sonny's disguise in the same way that his disguises never fool them. In the book, where first of all they had separate costumes and, as I mentioned, Olaf never shows up in person, it seems the weird magic that made shitty disguises work in this world did also apply to Klaus and his baby sister, as everyone including Esme, the hook-handed man and the bald man with the long nose were convinced that they were the white-faced twins despite looking nothing like them. They didn't catch on until the real twins showed up despite how clear it was that Klaus had no intention of killing 
killing Violet, and Esme revealing them to the crowd is more of an ad-lib on her part. Evidence that this was not the intended plan is reinforced by Olaf berating everyone for going off script and ruining his schemes at the end. The show makes it pretty clear, in fact it's the entire basis of the second episode, that all of this was part of Olaf's master plan to kill Violet and draw out and capture the other two Baudelaire's. This fixes a few issues, like why Olaf felt the need to put into place such a needlessly complicated plan to kill Violet, and why he didn't just try to keep her and make sure the other two burned to death in the hospital fire. However, my biggest issue with this new story climax is, if Olaf knew that the kids weren't really his henchmen, did he really think that Klaus was going to saw off his sister's head because of peer pressure? Do it. Do it. That's what the whole plan hinged on? That Klaus would rather murder his own sister than risk revealing himself and Sonny to a crowd of doctors? This shit makes even less sense now, guys. I'm sorry. I don't know if anyone else noticed this, but in the book it suggested that quite a few patients may have been left to burn to death in the hospital as Olaf ordered everyone who could move to surround it to stop the orphans from escaping, and it's mentioned that only some of them were outside at the end. Violet seems to come to her senses a lot quicker than in the book. It was actually a little feelings-inducing to read about her trying to think up some invention to save them all while clearly weak and disorientated as shit. They skipped over her rigging up a megaphone that sounded kind of like the hospital tannoy system to lead the crowd away so they could escape via the bungee cord, and, more importantly, the argument the orphans had about if they should all jump out of the window together or go one by one, with Klaus being unwilling to split up the family again, even if it made more sense to do so. If you've not read the books, it might surprise you to hear that the one who looks like neither a man nor a woman was supposed to die in this episode, being so committed to catching the Baudelaire's they never made it out of the burning building. I'm assuming this means that they're dropping the books one henchman loss per story from now on angle, and our tall friend here will be spared being eaten by lions in the next episode. I guess I'll find out shortly. In conclusion, eh, I've not backslid all the way to hating it again, but I'm well and truly in a no shits given about this show mindset right now. It's clearly bending over backwards to fill the plot holes that Handler's been quietly ignoring until now, and inadvertently creating a few of its own while doing so, and for an adaptation of a morbidly dark and intentionally bizarre reflection of the world, it's managing to be kind of dull at the moment. I don't know if Handler is being strong on by Netflix into changing things, if he's just really open to other people's input, or his sense of humour has really changed over the years, but I'm finding a lot of jokes increasingly at odds to the original tone of the books. They're not bad jokes as such, they just tend to undercut the source material slightly. I can see why this season was less popular with book fans. Thanks for joining me, my beautiful watchers. To save me from YouTube's Cthulhu-like algorithm monster, please remember to subscribe, like, share, and all that other jazz, and follow me on Twitter and Facebook if you want to hear updates on future projects, and or random valueless thoughts that float across my brain while I have access to a keyboard. See you soon. Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do, since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically, they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons, including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the dorm, I can't do that, for I have no money left after building a personal fortress to prepare for the coming zombie apocalypse. Do you have any idea how expensive a lifetime supply of food, water, and ammunition is? Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickeroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day, and I will see you in the next episode.